So I guess, first of all, I wanted to um, thank Nate Young for being here. Um, my name's Stephanie Cristello. Uh, I'm the artistic director of Expo Chicago and the editor-in-chief of The Scene, uh, Chicago's international journal of contemporary and modern art. Um, we're hosting this talk today with uh, Nate Young, who's represented by Monique Maloche Gallery in Chicago on uh, narrative and voids. And we're going to speak a lot about his recent work and um, you know, the sort of in-progress exhibition that he has upcoming as well as um, ones currently on view. Uh, but before I give some information into the exhibitions themselves, um, you know, we're obviously broadcasting from home. Um, this is a collaboration with the Scene and Expo, but we are at home, not in our offices. And um, this talk was really sort of born out of a new initiative that we launched with Expo Chicago, um, which is called the Online Dispatch. And it's really this uh, space for digital programming um, alongside exciting exhibitions and initiatives that are being done by our partners, both locally here in Chicago, um, institutions, organizations, galleries, but also around the world. And um, this talk is sort of the first in a, in a casual series um, between us and artists to support um, exhibitions that were postponed um, or canceled due to the crisis. And I did want to mention that the, the conversation that we'll be having today is going to be published on the Scene website and um, the new website will be launching next week. So um, for, for all of you that want to reference parts of this again, um, a transcription of the full interview will be there and likely other outlets. So, so this really started with, um, you know, Nate and I talking about his upcoming exhibition, which is at the Driehaus Museum, uh, the second in a series called A Tale of Today. And our collaborations with the Driehaus have sort of extended through the scene for quite some time since the launch of this contemporary uh, exhibition initiative. Like this was the cover of the scene for issue eight that featured Yinka Shonabari. Uh, it was the first contemporary exhibition that took place in the Driehaus Museum, which is an 1883 um, mansion, uh, formerly the Nickerson Mansion that shows decorative arts um, primarily from from the late 19th century and this exhibition that they did with Yinka Shonabari was really um, this is the catalog here as well really innovative in terms of placing contemporary work within the history of Chicago uh, and following this show is the next exhibition, which will feature Nate Young and Mika Horobuchi, and the, the entire sort of part of the exhibition is to create new works that respond to that space. So a lot of what Nate and I will be talking about today is, you know, surrounding the, the ideas and concepts um, that have been born out of that really unique uh, curatorial invitation. And also he has an, an exhibition on view right now at Monique Maloche Gallery. A lot of the pieces that we will be talking about today also, and we have some images of the installation, but what we're really going to dig into is, is all of the concepts uh, that Nate has been working with over the last few years and how they're developing now and uh, how they'll develop in the future. So I should say also at the end of this, um, for all of us that are new to Zoom, there's a Q&A function, which uh, will be directed to both Nate and I, we'll be able to see your questions. We'll be fielding those questions at the end of the talk, um, but please do send them throughout the, throughout the panel, um, throughout this interview, if uh, whenever they come to mind, we wanna keep this you know, quite open um, and as open as possible. So I guess, Nate, I just wanted to sort of start with introducing you and your work and a lot of the uh, sort of ideas that we've been talking about. And I have quite a few images of your current installation that's on view at Monique Maloche right now from the exhibition called The Transcendence of Time. Um, 
And so I was thinking of switching over my screen for you to talk a little bit about the exhibition, the new developments in your work, but specifically about the physical interaction to give um, all of the listeners here an option to sort of imagine walking through the space um, and how, how this work is embodied for you. So I'm going to switch over to that screen and let you talk. Cool. Well, first of all, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Expo, for hosting this. Uh, I'm excited to walk you all through some of this work. Um, okay. So there are kind of uh, two, maybe three things happening in the show. And one is in this first room, there are a series of works that um, are kind of similar to these works that I had been making a while back and that I was calling altars. Um, these are a little bit different and, and, the, and the subject matter of the work is a little bit different. Essentially, uh, what you have is uh, this sort of like cabinet structure that has two doors on the front that open and close. And, when, and, and then if you go to the next slide, maybe you can see a more detailed version of one. Yeah, so this is one of them where the doors are open and on the interior uh, printed, actually painted on a sheet of acrylic is uh, a text. And that text is a painting that I painted of my own handwriting, but, I, but what I'm writing in the text are excerpts from a suicide letter. Um, my great grandfather later in his life had developed maybe Alzheimer's or some forms of dementia and had gotten depressed and uh, attempted suicide. So I'm sort of embodying that text, writing that on here. And then what happens is when the doors close, they isolate certain parts of the text. At the same time, a light comes on that illuminates uh, a bone that's inside of and behind the tinted plexiglass. Uh, it's like uh, maybe that it's, it's a really difficult show to have in this time where people can't interact with it because it really requires uh, being in front of it. It sort of requires a body to interact with it, you know, because they open and close. Um, but the idea was that when, they, when they're closed, they block out certain parts of the text and they isolate other parts of the text. So uh, it's maybe difficult to see in this, in this image, um, but the text that is revealed says underneath. And that also is the title of this, mm -hmm. of this piece. Yeah, and you know, when we were speaking too, it's, it's a lot about the kinetic sort of um, potential of the work, that it does open and close, but it requires a body to do so. And right. you know, the, the vitrines that you have in the exhibition as well sort of follow this this logic where um, it's for me really about visibility and, and blindness and distance and what mm -hmm. you can see versus what you cannot see. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously the narrative that you're sort of mentioning about your, your grandfather and great grandfather and the uh, texts that you're pulling from here are a different kind of experiments in um, blindness, which is, you know, more of a historical blindness or a narrative blindness. But I think what carries across all of the work is that the viewer is sort of left to imagine what the, what the completed sentences are or what the completed image is, because right. what's often presented to them is limited by, by closeness. Um, you know, maybe it's also helpful to sort of speak through what happens with these vitrines um, and the lights coming on and off, similar to the what you just called cabinets, but what we've also talked about as, as these altars, and we'll get into that later. But this idea that when you approach the work, um, either a light comes on or a light goes off. And what's really left for a viewer is to see, um, have, have a portion of the work revealed or have the portion of the work disappear so that the viewer really sees their own reflection. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process of approaching these works um, and how you came up with, with that um, distance. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
again, it's like difficult unless you're in front of these things, because even when you're in front of them, they're kind of difficult to see. They're frustrating uh, sculptures to look at because you are aware you, when you're looking at them, you could see that there's something there. So essentially, if you're in this image, you could see that there's a black, uh, like sort of tabletop on this vitrine. That that black surface is actually translucent. So um, as you approach the the object, the vitrine, uh, you can kind of see that there's something in there. And what's in there is a bone. It's a it's a it's a horse bone, uh, but it's really dimly lit because the 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 plexi is so tinted. And as you get um, close to them, they they disappear. So essentially, you, you trip a sensor, which makes them, uh, tur tur it makes a light turn off, and then they become invisible. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been thinking about ways to make objects that r essentially sort of like run away from you, run away from the viewer, or like escape the viewer, so that they're in a constant state of, of being fugitive. Yeah. Uh, and so your, and I, the fullness of your understanding is difficult. It's difficult to, to have a fullness of understanding of the object because it's always like in a mode of escape. Yeah. And, and conceptually, like you mentioned the word fugitive. And I think, you know, that really is the underpinning of the, the start of this narrative too. And, you know, the horse bones that are featured in these works are real horse bones. But I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, how the horse bones sort of factored into the work, like what the symbolism is behind those for you uh, in relation to the narrative of your great grandfather and, and his journey. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this work has a lot of narrative in it. And I've been thinking about ways to build that narrative into the work. And some of it is sort of just like, uh, uh, it's, it's a longer term project, meaning that I've been making works that deal with uh, uh, this particular narrative over the last two and a half years or so. And um, I think as one experiences more of the work, they, the more of the narrative starts to unfold. Long story short, my great grandfather um, migrated during uh, the early 1900s from the South. I, more recently actually found out he left from North Carolina and ended up in uh, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia, like many other people in the early 1900s. Between 1920 and 1970, over six million Black folks migrated from the rural South to Northern cities, essentially trying to better themselves, more job opportunities and education and so on. My grandfather, my great grandfather was part of that movement. Um, a lot of people also left because they were in some kind of duress. Uh, my grandmother told me they were trying to get him, which essentially, you know, I took to mean like some kind of lynch mob or KKK. And there are a whole bunch of stories about, about him that I've been mining. And I've been thinking about the objects in some ways, the, the way you experience the objects, trying to create an experience of the object that parallels one's experience of understanding uh, their own identity through their own memory. Mm -hmm. um, and, and recently I, I was listening to this lecture by this neuroscience who was talking about um, how the more often you retrieve a memory, uh, the more it actually degrades. So yeah. as you tr attempt to get closer and closer to an understanding of something that happened, it actually moves away from you. So I was thinking about these, these objects in that way too, like, the, like, you know, that they run away from you or they try to escape you. And also like that fugitiveness being parallel to my great grandfather's fugitive state in his migratory, like, you know, being. I was most interested in like, what he experienced in the journey, as opposed to like who he was before and who he was after. Because before he left, he had one identity. And when he arrived, he changed his identity and became, uh, he took on another identity. He changed his name, he remarried, started a new family. But in between those two places, in theory, maybe he had no identity. 
that's the way that I was thinking about this kind of right and when we were speaking also it's this idea of the void right like he he starts as one person ends up another person but what happens in that journey and this comes up a lot in you know all sorts of narratives of mythology of transformation that there is this nothingness um a non-identity a non-void that happens in his isolation essentially um, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I was really excited to talk with you about this work, particularly now, um, you know, when isolation has become such a prevalent thing for many of us and, and an essential thing is, you know, how, how that remoteness sort of leads to generation of a narrative, a generation of a narrative that's a bit more imaginative, a bit more open as opposed to um, a straight void of nothingness. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you know, your relationship to this narrative um, as either fact or fiction or a mixture of the two and how you're sort of positioned essentially as, as a narrator of this isolation, of this isolation period in his life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm a, I will try to address that. I, would, I just want to say one more thing that I think is pertinent to uh, having an understanding of uh, the narrative that I'm talking about in my great grand grandfather and where the bones come in. So uh, I later found out, once I actually had started working on this project, I found out that he had ridden a horse from North Carolina to Ardmore. And because he was fugitive in order to hide the horse, he, uh, he killed the horse and he buried the horse. Later, I found the location of the burial of the horse and exhumed the bones. So and these, there's, and these were, the, there's that these objects in the vitrines are those bones. Yes. Yes. Those are the bones that are in the vitrines. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say that because I think that that makes some people might be like, what the fuck are these bones doing? Excuse yeah. my language. Uh, but it, there's that, that's where that comes from. Right. Um, yeah. The void, I, I mean, in terms of isolation, maybe, there's something about quietness that, uh, or I mean, absence, uh, more generally thinking about absence or a void as something that um, has, a, has potential as opposed to lack. Uh, there's this essay by this writer that I'm really into uh, where uh, his name is Fred Moten and he talks about, um, remaining in the hold and he talks about the hold of the slave ship being a space wherein the subjectivity of the the individual becomes object and there's a kind of void then of subjectivity if you will if you will and that there's a, a kind of black study that wants to fill that void and 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 he talks about like remaining in that void as opposed to trying to fill that void, because what comes out of that void is actually maybe more generative than filling the void with something that is conventional. Like the conventional idea of subjectivity could potentially fill that void. But if you remain in, in the hold or in the void, that there are all these other potentials that could come, like, I don't know, jazz or hip hop or, you know, the, the, kind, of, the kind of things that blackness uh, uh, has come up with from positions of marginality or you might say lack but i don't think i would want to call it lack because it lack uh presumes something pejorative and i'm yeah. trying to think about it in a different kind of way i was almost thinking about it in terms of like positions of desire too like that there's within this void the the will to want to attain something and that attainability or the the possibility of it is what continues the generation of of essentially like the creativity that comes out of it you know i'm thinking about for you specifically there is this desire to retrieve a family history a family ancestry a subjective narrative but you're doing it in a very objective way right like the um the very premise of an exhibition is to invite others to sort of become become that character um or enact that character in some way yeah 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 and i don't know i think there's a lot of writing about this where once you've 
once you have um, achieved desire or achieved and possessed the thing that you want, you can no longer desire it um, because you can only desire what you do not have. Like I'm thinking right. of this, um, this text on Eros um, by Anne Carson, which is, you know, basically the history, it's a cultural history of desire taken from mostly classics and um, ancient Greek and Roman theory. But I feel like what you're doing is really bringing the past up to meet you in some way. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Oh, well, yeah, definitely. There's a way that I'm thinking about, especially in the show at Monique's, uh, and, and the title is a reference to this idea of collapsing time. Uh, I would say like desire, I just want to say one thing in terms of desire or void is that to me, it's really important that the thing that's de that is desired is unattainable. That the audience may desire to see the object, but it's always, I'm always trying to, in this work, I have been for a long time trying to figure out ways to uh, withhold mm -hmm. access so that when you see the bone, you see a reflection of it, or you see a kind of distorted image of it, or a drawing for that matter. Or a, a way for me. Yourself. Say it again. Or a reflection of yourself. Right, right. When the light cuts out like, and you're faced with a mirror, essentially. Um, right. I mean, is it, we have a question from the audience too, which is, um, you know, if your narrative and storytelling sort of functions for you more as allegory in a symbolic register. Um, well, that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about it allegorically before. Um, maybe there's some way in which the word, that word, that term fits in that I'm, I'm maybe trying to propose, I would say that my desire would be to propose more than just this historical narrative that's really personal to me as allegorical, but the idea of history in general as mm -hmm. actually allegory, that we, the way we understand the past is, uh, through this kind of like tinted plexi. And mm -hmm. then as we get closer to understanding it, it runs away from us. And so, uh, but, it, but it produces a kind of understanding of ourselves, if, if it's a personal kind of history. Uh, but it's almost like it can only, because you can't really access it, it can only produce an allegory for an understanding of one's own self. Uh, so, if there's an allegory, it's, it's that the whole entire thing is allegory. I'm not like saying it's allegory for something else. It's allegory for the idea that maybe the entire entirety of historical understanding is allegorical. Right. And you and I have spoken about this too, in terms of, you know, the, the family narrative and how important that is, that very subjective narrative coming across to the viewer, because in a sense, the, a lot of it is stripped away. Um, and the work adopts, um, this is mentioned in another comment from the audience, is that it adopts this sort of archival, um, historical aesthetic, but at the same time, it's also sort of winking at the viewer um, that these are obviously not historical objects. They're, they incorporate parts of now, parts of then, in ways that wouldn't have been able to exist um, yeah, then. Yeah. I'm even yes. thinking about, you know, what you said about um, altars and churches and basically like what this pictorial, what this pictorial style really means for you as, um, as you presenting images. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, the, the relationship of images to language, um, monochromes to language, and and that history of the church that you were sort of speaking about a few days ago about altar pieces. Um, yeah, I want to, I want to address that. And I want to address, I want to go back to the question that you asked before and address that real quick too, because I, I want to just talk about real quick coll the collapsing of time and mm -hmm. the way that that really has more to do with those pieces, the altar pieces that are in the front room. 
I've also been referring to them as uh, um, not vitrines, but um, why did I just blank on the word? Uh, <laughs> you said cabinets before. Is that what it? Cabinets, but also there's a, there there okay. There's a thing that holds a holy thing, a relic. Mm -hmm. It's called a reliquary. Yeah. Yes. So I've, I've been thinking about them as reliquaries and mm -hmm. thinking about the container as a thing that brings uh, value to the object that it contains. And that in some ways, the object is almost arbitrary. It's the container that actually produces the, the believability or the legibility even of the importance of, of the object. So, I mean, and that relates to, you know, because as soon as you start talking about reliquaries, you're talking about talking about religion, you're talking about church, or um, even the architecture of a church being a structure that produces, yeah, there, Monique knew what I was thinking, reliquary, yeah. I can see it in the chat. Thanks, uh, thanks Monique. Um, right, but it's also this, you know, you're making essentially an architecture where the believability of this narrative that you've likely made up, but no one will really know unless, you know, they're speaking with you. But if they're going through the show, if a visitor is going through the show, um, you've built your own type of reliquary. You've built your own type yeah. of religious architecture in the sense that what's the point of church? It's to make you believe in God. Um, right. It's to basically right. like make a following. And, and for you, it's to make you believe in this mythic narrative or likely mythic narrative of, I guess of your grandfather's horse. Great -grandfather. I would say I would say to that the thing that I'm most invested in is how I, I mean to me whether or not someone believes is I don't, I don't mind if people believe or if they don't believe like I'm not trying to convert anybody to a belief system but I'm, I, I would like to highlight the structure through which we could get to belief. You know what I mean? Like, how could this story about my grandfather be believable? Well, I mean, it's obviously believable. Let me just, like, in quotes. Let's uh, take that, yeah, let's take that for granted. Because, because, because look at the bones. Like, right. if you were to toss the bones on the ground and they landed in a certain way, doesn't that kind of ritual prove something i mean again not that i'm trying to prove anything but i want to look at the way that proof can be constructed right. i do want to get back to collapsing time in a second though <laughs> we're going to keep coming back to it that's the whole point we're going to collapse time throughout this whole conversation <laughs> this is maybe the only one where we can go back and forth and it actually makes sense right right <laughs> um yeah, but you said something about the grandness of churches. Like when you walk in there, it's grand. Yeah. And when you experience your work, it's it's almost the opposite. It's intimate. Yeah, it's intimate. Um, so, well, I mean, coincidentally, the works at the Driehaus Museum are 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 somewhat uh, ornate. I mean, I don't though for those of you in the audience, if you haven't yeah. been in that space and you live in or can visit Chicago, you should definitely go check it out. It's an amazing piece of architectural feat and the woodworking in there is outstanding. Everything amazing. is just outrageously ornate. Um, it's over the top. I think you could make the most ornate object possible in your practice and it would still look minimal, you know, within the, yeah, right. the grander context. But those are kind of like on steroids. The, the pieces at Driehaus are like, way hyped up and I mean way turned up in terms of ornateness. The pieces at Monique's I don't think are, I wouldn't call them ornate, but they are, they do have an aesthetic that's kind of like slick and clean. It's more like, you know, uh, a modernist church architectural aesthetic as opposed to like a, you know, 17th century or 18th century uh, Catholic, you know, cathedral kind of architecture it's not like that but it's still about um being slick being clean uh it's like if uh if the ideas that are proposed as believable or legible are going to stick they would have to stick onto something that doesn't like the object can't look like it's getting ready to fall over no. because then the idea falls over with it yeah you know 
Right, yes, sort of they're in between those aesthetics. I mean, one thing that I just really want to drive home is is that the reason why these these large paintings, these elaborate frescoes, um, you know, basically what we identify as most of our history was commissioned for the church was because they were communicating to an illiterate audience. Um, and in some yes. ways, you're making the work illiterate for most of the audience when the when the doors to the reliqui the reliquaries are closed because what you can see is is one word but you don't have the context of what the the sentences are saying so it's almost like right. taking it's almost you know removing language um by using language if that makes sense all, all of the words that i um when it, so when they close they reveal certain words and they block out other words all right. of the they words become, they that are left right they become what they become emblematic, where like those words become a caption to a larger story. So, but the the narrative, in a lot of ways, falls away and becomes like specific as opposed to yes. general. Well, they ref they they all refer to place, like underneath, um, or it talks about a stone on top of a hill, and then another one, um, just references the object of the horse mm -hmm. and the bones, and then what is the other one? Um, they all kind of refer to place. And the way that I was thinking about those is that um, what it's like, uh, if, because the question is, how did I find the, the horse? Right. How did I find the burial site? And in some ways I was thinking about actually really directly, I should say I was, uh, I wanted those objects with the bones in them in the front where they open and close to answer that question. So they, um, they refer to the place. So the idea is this, my grandfather wrote this suicide letter, but the shape of the bones when held over the top of the letter then reveal certain words, which then are clues to the location of the burial of the horse. Mm -hmm. So, but that's anachronistic, right? Because the, the bones of the horse- Have already been exhumed. Didn't, Right, and they didn't exist when he wrote them. So I was thinking like, well, what if one could collapse time and the object actually generates its own narrative? So the idea that they were buried and then there are clues to them are generated through the object itself, mm -hmm. uh, which is a common idea in time travel called a causal loop, that when one goes back in time, they could influence the past in a way that would produce the existence of the present in in the way that it exists currently, mm -hmm. but it couldn't have existed that way unless the, the event in the past had happened. So it just yeah. creates this loop. Yeah. Uh, so I couldn't have found the bones unless he already had the bones, but he would have had to have buried the, use the bones in order to send a message. So I'm in some ways thinking about communing with him through the collapse of time. And at the same time, also like uh, it's dark because I started to think at some point that maybe death was a transcendent, a, a space that tra also transcended time. Mm -hmm. So that in his own suicide, it was like a, an attempt to access uh, a space outside of time and then communicate these, you know, secret messages. Right. And there's a word for <laughs> that too, like it's that. called psychonography, which is, you know, like the huh. hidden messages, um, you know, used a lot in in every narrative of, of fugitives navigating through through the world because you have to mm -hmm. make the message clear enough so that someone looking for it will find it, but it has to disappear from from view so that the people communicating are no longer in danger. And there's two amazing steganography is the steganography. term. Um, two amazing questions from the audience um, that we've gotten that directly relate to this. So I just want to address them yeah, now yeah. before we continue on. Um, one, do the words then for you become a map? Yes. Um, instructions for locating them. I see and, that question and the answer is yes. That's yeah. the way that I'm yeah. thinking about them. And then this At one- At this point, it's still sort of an incomplete map, but um, yeah. they're right. starting to refer to location. But they, yeah, they give the, the essence of navigation in some mm -hmm. way, right? And then this other one, which 
maybe also relates to this idea of hidden messages. Uh, I'm going to read it directly. The greatest moral imperative for a bondsman, slave, or prisoner is escape. Is escape still the most heroic idea for an African American man today? The greatest moral imperative for a bondsman, slave, or prisoner is escape. Is escape still the most heroic? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I'm, I, I guess I'm more interested in, um, if, you know, there are fugitive slaves that started what they called maroon communities. So when one is escaping, the presumption is that they're escaping to somewhere, to arrive somewhere else. So for right. in my great grandfather's, you know, case, escaping from uh, an oppressive cultural, you know, social situation to another and one that he perceived as uh, having more opportunity. Um, but again, like I said, like that, it to me, um, it's the it's the moment of fugitivity that is most interesting because in that moment, uh, between being that in that there's a few mm -hmm. so instead of um Nate, you just you broke up for a moment so i'm not sure if, if all of the if um, the moral imperative is there instead of adopting the conventions of uh, culture, one instead, but stay in the state of fugitivity and what that, uh, what it means to, what it means to be human, essentially, what it means to be social or what it means to be in community with people. Am I breaking up? Yep. Yeah, you were breaking up on that really great long run that I wish I could have heard, um, but you seem to be better now. I wonder if uh -oh, you can just frozen. give us the quick notes of that, of that one. Am I back? You're back. Was I, was I, am, am I, I was frozen? It was cutting in and out. Oh, damn. I said some real good stuff. I know. It was like, <laughs> it was like genius. Y'all are just going to have to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us the cliff notes? Because I know it ended with being human. I guess, right? Like, I guess that the um, I'm I'm thinking about escape, and um, escape has a goal of arriving yeah. somewhere where one could be free. If one was a slave, now one is free. Uh, yeah. But freedom, if freedom means conformity to the. Uh, position of power that created the oppressed uh, state in the first place, the, the position of power created the slavery. And that is, you know, you know, European colonialism, let's say, that I'm more interested in the in remaining in the space of fugitivity. Because right. if you don't arrive at the freedom, the perceived freedom, uh, then you could you have the ability to imagine new ways of being. Yeah new conventions in terms of being a subject or being a human. Right, it's, same, it's the same Fred Moten discourse. You yes, know, from yes, the, it's from totally Fred. From the beginning, and I like that that's coming full circle. It's about staying in the hold, staying in the void. Yeah, totally, um, totally, totally. You know, so, but I'm, but I'm, you know, that, that to me, it all goes back to the way that the images run away, like the objects run away from your perception, your memories run away from your, your ability to access them. The text, when I'm writing text in the work and telling the story literally through drawing and text in the work, that those are kind of like um, inconsistent, you know, because they're a product of my own uh, stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of that for, for me points to the inability to land uh, and, yeah. and attempting to remain uh, in a state of Limbo. fluidity or flux. Yeah. Um, so we have about five minutes left. So I just wanted to 
put out a final call to any of the audience members for Q and A's and then we'll go through it. And while, while people are typing their questions, I wanted to ask you the last one. Um, well, I have so many, but the last one, at least on my end for now, um, which is if you could define the difference between a blind spot and a blind point. And I'm gonna give that um, a little bit of shading. So in the Foucault, um, the, the book, The Order of Things, um, he talks about Velasquez as the Las Meninas painting, which is, you know, sort of purposefully vacant, really reminds me of your work in the sense that it has the same sort of um, early aesthetics, but also it's in a lot of ways empty. And there's, you know, the mirror in the back, which is the portrait of the king and the queen that the, um, panel that the painting was commissioned for and he talks about the mirror as a blind point in that it's the essential hiding place into which our into which our gaze disappears from ourselves at the moment of actual looking and i'm wondering if you think that your work for viewers um, essentially makes their own gaze disappear um, and they can become more acutely aware of, of their observation, whether that's physical um, or more conceptual in terms of like how they relate to the narratives that you're putting out? Well, I hope so. I mean, I hope that one um, interacts with the work with actually, that the work, what, what I would like is for the work to produce a heightened awareness of one's own looking and subjectivity. Uh, the awareness that the way that you're understanding reality is um, contingent on your own experience or your own body um, and that all of these experiences are are social right mm -hmm. so they re language relies on context um, and it's about for me I, I really I hope that the way the work points to that and produces, does produce an awareness of that. And I don't know if that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some good questions in this chat. I know, there's really good questions. I'm like so impressed with everybody that, and thank you for everyone that's tuning in. Um, Nate, do you want to take your, you want to take your pick? Yeah, let me look. Uh, Give us a second. These questions are excellent, but they're each like a paragraph long, so. Henry Box Brown. Can, can we, um, I'm curious about that, but I wanna hear, I wanna, is there a way that you can let the, uh, uh, the questioner, uh, can we let their audio come in so they can elaborate on that? I'm curious. I think we can. Um, Probably got to unmute. I can't unmute. So Naima Morgan. Um, yeah. There. Perfect. Hi. Hi, Nate. Hi, What's everyone. Up? Hi, Stephanie. Sorry, my kids are screaming in the in the background. But I was, as you were speaking about fugitivity and escape, I couldn't help but think about the story of Henry Box Brown, who was a uh, who, was, who escaped slavery by shipping himself in a, in a wooden box. And oh, also thinking right. about uh, your relationship to craft and material, you know, and that connection. So that became really prominent um, for me. But I was just throwing that out there. I didn't have a question about it. Um, oh, that, you know, but that's a good, uh, that's a really, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, mm -hmm. I like that as a parallel to like thinking about the hold, you know, the, yeah, the yeah. vehicle for 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 his birth into freedom is actually it's similar to the vehicle of his, you know, maybe you could say decline into yeah. objectivity. That yeah. he becomes an object mm -hmm. that then is shipped, and that he has to sort of return to that state of stripped down subjectivity. Mm -hmm. in order yeah. to like move toward another kind of subjectivity that yeah, yeah i hadn't thought about that but that's that's dope i should 
also interesting with the actual, you know, the box shape of the works themselves. Yeah, the vitrine totally. The wall. Um, well, that's really great. And I think we have another, thank you, Naima. Um, we have another Thanks. question from Amanda Williams. Um, if we could unmute Amanda. Um, and Amanda, you can let me know if you want me to read out the question out loud or if you prefer to. All right, you should be allowed to speak. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Amanda, how's it going? Hey, Nate, this is excellent. Um, I came a few seconds late, so I'm not sure if you talked about it. It actually connects really beautifully to the question about Henry Box Brown. Um, because of your, um, your choice of wood, I'm wondering if you could just talk about materiality and if you find that it becomes important to you when you're forming the pieces that the wood either have some connection to geography or location to the story and or um, materially do you look for things that might themselves resist so I don't I don't know enough about wood to know like an idea about hard to hard to work woods or woods that fight you or what you know what I mean something about whether that yeah. might also play into um, how you think about form making not just the shapes but how you think about the performance of the material no that's a good that's a good question I mean there there was a a lot of the works, some of the earlier works that I was doing in wood were um, made out of oak. And it was really just, you know, oak being a really common wood that was used in a lot of architecture and churches and things like that. And I had these church pews, or I had this one church pew mm -hmm. that was made out of oak. And I started making a whole bunch of work that I was trying to reference that, the aesthetic of that material. Um, the other pieces, the vitrines that are in the show at Monique's are walnut. And to be, I shouldn't be this honest, but I'm gonna be 100% honest. <laughs> that material, if I had, if I had the, uh, in an ideal world, I wanted to make those out of acacia. Uh, oh, because wow. acacia is the wood that allegedly uh, God told Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant out of. So, there's wow. this kind of like spiritual ramification. And also in some cultures, acacia is used for grave markers. Oh, the wow. actual tree. So uh, I'm working on getting a hold of some of that. It's, it's, there's a few species that are common in woodworking. They're really difficult to get. One is Hawaiian koa and Hawaiian koa, it can't be shipped off the island. So you have to go there to work with yeah. it and then you can ship the objects back. And the other one is Australian blackwood. Um, again, super rare, difficult to get a hold of in the States. And then there are some other ones in India. There are a whole bunch of different genuses of it. Uh, but I'm working on that right now. Uh, the walnut maybe in some ways is more of an aesthetic choice because I, I like the contrast of the mm -hmm. dark wood with the, the, the black shapes. They're kind of like minimalist objects, you know. But yeah, that's a, that's a good... That's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank I think you. we have one from Devin Mays here. So I'm wondering if we could um, get him on. What up? What up? All right, give us one moment. All right, Devin, you should be able to speak if you unmute. Oh, my, am I? You're in here. You're in here. We, we can hear you. I'm in. Yep. Yo. Hey, um, sorry, I'm really bad with this technology stuff. So just quick question was actually it's pretty it's a pretty open big question, but I was curious if you could talk about what your work or what you feel as if your work is in service of or in service to. And that's mm -hmm. been kind of the thing I've been thinking about um a lot, just in general, and even kind of how I pivot between being in service of something or a service to something. And it feels like your work and from our conversations and even the kind of attention to detail, both formally conceptually and the kind of care, both formally conceptually, that it seems that there seems to be some sort of servicing. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious if you kind of talk about what that servicing is. I guess, I don't know, I mean, that's a that's 
Dev, Devin, that's like one of those stumpers that you could like ask any artist in a lecture and, then, and if they're not ready for it, they're just like, you just fucked up my brain. <laughs> 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 but I guess, I mean, if I were to say in a more general sense, I want my work to be in service of stimulating a kind of poten the potential of new ways of thinking. And I know that's really broad. Um, it's definitely not about the experience, the aesthetic experience in and of itself, but because I, I don't wanna, I'm not a formalist. Uh, some, sometimes I'm mistaken for a formalist, but I try to make objects that have reference to things that exist in the world. And, and there's a reason for the referent to the thing in the world, because that's the thing in the world that I want to question, uh, whether it's religion or history or um, even just like personal identity. Like, how do I know that I exist? Um, so trying to direct the objects as a referent to specific things is a way for me at least to attempt to generate a more critical maybe slower, slowed down way of just like thinking about being in the world. Can I, can I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, go ahead. Too? Like if I, if I had to say what uh, Nate's work is in service of and in service to, I think the answer to both is metaphor. It's like really to give names to nameless things. Um, and I was thinking about this last night, in terms of bones, um, you know, the, the metaphor, the word metaphor um, is a species of symbol that was born out of um, how in ancient Greece you used to show your love, which is they would take the knuckle bone of an animal and present it to the, to the other person to see if the knuckle bones matched and could be one. So it's the melding of two different things to become one thing. And I don't know if that's, you know, um, I don't know, it just, I don't know if it's a coincidence, honestly. I think that the, the relationships to bones and, and how you transfer one narrative to another object or another image or another text is all hyper metaphorical um, in a way that allows access into these other narratives and other worlds. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I definitely feel like I'm employing metaphor as a strate strategic device. Um, at the same time, there are also things that are um, really like literal, too. You know what I mean? Like the literalness of the bone or the literalness of the literality of the uh, of the story. And I don't know if literality is a word. I don't think it is, but hey, Gary, I'm glad you're doing all right. Good to hear from you. I'm glad you're staying sane. And I'm glad my work is helping. There was a question back here. Can we, can we, can we, can I grab another question? Yeah, yeah grab one. Okay. And wrestling with, and wrestling the term kafabe is a portrayal of staged events within the industry of real or true. The term refers to guarding the suspension of the illusion of the real as if existing in the genuine. In other words, not breaking character. How would you relate this suspension to your interest in staying fugitive and generative uh, mythology surrounding the object? I mean, that's, I, I like that question. I don't know if I have a, I don't, I definitely don't have a definitive answer to that question. I know that um, in terms of staying in character, um, it's, it's sort of a balancing act because to me, a certain level of, or a certain amount of doubt is important to the work. Like, I, I mean, like I've been saying, like what's important to me is uh, uh, thinking about how one believes. And if I were to talk about a thing or an ideology or a story or 
a religious artifact or something like that in a way that convinced one thoroughly, there would no longer be any doubt. So in the dissolving of doubt, there no longer remains any space for critically thinking about belief. So again, like I said, I, I, I don't know if I have a definitive answer, but I know that it's, it's a balancing act. You know what I mean? Like I would, I would, I would, uh, I mean, I guess when I'm in this show at Monique's is the first time for me, at least in the way that I think about the way that the work reads uh, is where I'm like sort of proposing this thing that's not possible unless one collapsed time or one went through a portal or one died uh, and transcended time. And then there was a second part of your question that talked to me, you asked about, um, how would that relate to staying fugitive? I mean, that's a good, I mean, I like that you're making that connection between remaining, the balancing act that I'm describing between what you're calling k um, and um, and doubt. Uh, that remaining in that in-between space between belief and doubt is sort of another parallel between in, in, in parallels the fugitive space. So yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't actually thought of it that way, but I'm glad that you uh, brought that up. Thank you. All right, I wanna end on one last question from an anonymous attendee. So sorry, we can't have you uh, ask this yourself, but I'll do my best. Um, the optimist aesthetics of minimalist objects that dominate the visual present are the same aesthetics of the market and are perhaps the aesthetics of economic freedom or at least upward mobility. Your aesthetics seem church-like about antiquity and stagnation. How do those differences between freedom, stagnation, economic and religious map onto your thinking of race, gender, and the American present? Good question. Who wrote that question? In anonymous <laughs> That's a good anonymous question. Um, I have to read it again, try to understand it. Optimistic it's aesthetics. How do, you, how, do you, um, how do you reconcile the sort of the marketability of your work with these more ancient aesthetics between freedom and, um, you know, stopping time, essentially, I guess, um, and thinking about how, how you can reconcile that both in your work, but also for race, gender, and things that we're dealing with in the US right now. Or are they, are they reconciled? I mean, that's, that's how I'm reading. I mean, like, are they, are they able to exist alongside one another? Or does the work necessarily have to collapse those, those two things? Or I don't know, I would argue that it kind of also stays, yeah. stands in the hold. I don't think it's, uh, for me, it's not, it never is really an attempt to reconcile. Uh, I would be more motivated to attempt to uh, address things that are like paradoxical, things that are unreconcilable. Those are the kind of things that I want to think about. Um, like, yeah, but I'm, I'm just trying to piece together and thinking about this idea of, of, uh, uh, minimalist, or I would say maybe modernist or postmodernist aesthetics and the market and church and, um, antiquity and, uh, newness and tithing. Like that's a lot of different stuff. And I guess if there were any kind of reconciliation in terms of the way that that relates to race and gender in the American present is that, I, I mean, I'm most interested in thinking about the ruptures in uh, a, percep a perceivable static identity like blackness or, or maleness or gender. That it's not about reconciling that race and gender, it's about seeking out and embracing the rupture mm -hmm. uh, that's i mean i guess that's all i can that's the only way i can think about that yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, these are yeah, all good some... questions. Thank you so much to everyone who's. who's yeah, for sure. Here. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a few. Uh, oh, one more. Okay. Sorry. The rupture and code switching. I mean, it's somewhat similar. The question was, yeah. do you relate this rupture to code switching? And, and, and I think code switching. Can you give us a sense of what that is? Code switching? Yeah. Code switching is like, uh, you know, talking black or talking white and having the ability to put on a different, to embody a different cultural character that fits into a, a specific cultural context. Like the way you talk at home versus the way you talk in a job interview. Yeah. yeah. Dave Chappelle talks about this shit all the time. He's got a good, good, good white guy voice. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, in some ways code switching is maybe an older idea. It's, it's maybe code switching at this point, I feel like is very conventional. Whereas there are other kinds of ruptures that I think are more generative because one can't, still can't quite wrap their head around it. Um, I mean, for me, thinking about, and, and this is not a, a territory that I tread into because I don't uh, have a personal relationship to this identity, but gender uh, bending or gender trans people and the way that one could be forced into uh, grappling with gender terms because the 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 interaction with the person might not match the conventional way that we would be used to thinking about gender and that's that's like more radical than code switching in my opinion i think right there's a similarity but like how could we push code switching further into into the mm -hmm. future yeah and you know even in in the exhibition that's coming up at the Dree House, sort of holography makes an appearance like we didn't want to give any of those works away because a lot of them you know will make sense much more in the context of of that space but um you know it's really i think that what we sort of touched upon here is is the beginnings of how you've how you from what i can tell are pushing the boundaries further in this upcoming exhibition so um you know holography apparitions secrets riddles you know, things like this there's mm -hmm. there's an element of magic i think to the to the next work that i think is going to be really interesting to see again with all of what we spoke about in the context of of the monique malo show up right now so i think that's a pretty good place to end um, i wanted to thank um, the Dialogues Program presenting sponsor, um, which is the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, like I said, we're going to be making this conversation available online um, as a transcription on the scene, um, and we'll be launching the new website next week. So uh, thank you so much, Nate, and everybody so for, for joining. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming out or logging in. Be safe, be healthy. Uh, yeah, and we'll keep everybody uh, apprised of the next conversation as um, as we're doing them throughout the online dispatch.